Good morning and thank you for joining us. If you're new, welcome. There is a place for you here. At Woods Chapel Church, we are one church with three different campuses. In Lee Summit. Raytown. And here in Blue Springs. We are a group of people doing our best to love God and those around us. Our vision is to build transforming communities where everyone is included, accepted, and loved. All of us are on a journey. This is a place where you can ask difficult questions about faith and life. We are here to help and support each other. Thanks for joining us. No matter who you are or where you're from, we want you to know that you are welcome. Well, hi, my name is Allison. Uh, We're so glad that you have joined us on Facebook Live. And uh, this morning, I just want to encourage you, when it's on Facebook Live only, and people aren't together in the same room, it's really important that you all connect with one another. So don't be shy about commenting, um, interacting about what's being said or sung. And so to get that started this morning, I just want to put a question out there for Facebook people. Uh, What is your favorite thing about the holidays? Either a tradition that your family has or a holiday dish or cookie recipe or I don't know, something that is like, this is what I look forward to during this time. Uh, It could be more deep than that, but it could be cookies. I said last week, it could be sweet potato casserole. I'm always stuck on food. Anyway, uh, if you are new with us, we're excited that you're a part of our community. We want to invite you to join right in, jump in on the commenting, and comment the word new. Um, that way we know that you're here. We know that, um, that you're among us. We can welcome you in. So uh, we're just going to pray to get started this morning, and then we'll head into our time of worship together. So pray with me, please. Loving God, we are excited about this time together. We're excited about this season. We need this joy and hope. God, as we remember the anticipation, the hopeful excitement of, for the coming Savior, God, we're in this place right now of needing hope, of looking forward to a time when things are different, when things are better. But God, we know that even if our circumstances don't change, you are still worthy of praise. God, your love and your grace that you give us is reason enough for us to offer our praise and thanks back to you. So God, even though things aren't ideal right now, you still are the one that we look to for the hope, joy, peace, and love that we celebrate during this Advent season. So turn our eyes to you in this moment, over this next hour of worship. Bring us together, unify us, and help us to realize that you are that source. We give this time to you. We pray that it would bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read to you guys out of uh, John 1. It's my favorite set of verses during the Christmas season. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you're not familiar, the Word means Christ. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created. Life was in Him, and that life was the light of all. The light shines in the darkness, and the dark did not overcome it. There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and they didn't receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That is what we have come here to celebrate today, the grace and truth that we are offered and given this season. So sing with us.
Christmas tree tells the story of our family through its ornaments. I picked this ornament out because it's um, a bunny and I like bunnies and it's a baby's first Christmas and it's it was made in 20, 2013. I picked this ornament because it has a picture of our first dog, Flurry, in it, and our grandmother made it. Um, I picked this ornament out because it has animals golfing in it. It is special to me because my family likes to go uh, golfing together. We like to go to the golfing a golfing range and mini golfing together as a family together. I like this ornament because it reminds me of our first Christmas together in 2005 and Chuck and I put it on the tree together. And my favorite is a crystal set passed down from my grandmother when she passed away. The first Christmas after she passed, my aunt was decorating the house with it and the very first ornament she put up fell down and broke and I've kept it that way ever since because I use it to remind myself of the story and how much I miss and I love my family back in Pennsylvania. The end. The end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good job everybody. Well, good morning. Uh, I thank you for joining us. I know you have a lot of options on Sunday morning, so thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for the Kleinhagen family for doing that amazing video. Uh, feel free to comment. It was a great video. I was talking with Chuck, and he said that it only took us 18 times to get that shot right. And so thank you guys for doing that. Wasn't that the perfect Christmas video? Now, I love Christmas. You all know this. I have my Christmas sloth shirt on. If y'all want to zoom in on that, on that shot, that is an amazing Christmas sloth that reminds us to slow down, that this time of year is important, that there are things um, around us that we can participate in. And it's easy for us to go, go, go. And I think this pandemic right now is forcing us to slow down. Now, because I love Christmas so much, we've been celebrating Christmas in my house for at least two weeks, maybe three. I'm not really sure when we put our decorations up. Um, some of you get mad at me because you say we should wait till after Thanksgiving, and that's just not true. It's not what Jesus would do. And so that is um, the place in my house. Now, y- you all know me. I've talked about this before. I love Christmas so much. We have like seven trees in our house. I'm not making that up. Seven Christmas trees. Now, we have three in the entryway uh, that used to represent our three kids. Now we have four kids, so I need to find another one. Uh, but some, the kids have, uh, some of them have trees in their room. And when we have a real tree that we go and get the weekend after Thanksgiving, and we go to White Pine Farm out by Florida Sage High School, and we get this real tree. Now, that tree, um, my wife puts like beautiful white lights on it and, and ribbons, and it has all the ornaments that match. You all know what I'm talking about about those kind of ornaments. Now, the reason she does that is because uh, it saves our marriage and it saves our family if I don't do it. And so, like, because I get mad, I'll cuss and I'll yell and I don't, like, it's, I, I hate Christmas lights. They're the worst thing in the world. But that's her tree and that she does it really well and it's beautiful. And, and, and you walk into the room and you're like, oh my gosh, Christmas. But the most important tree in our house is not those trees. The most important tree is actually, uh, I brought a picture. Now, I know a lot of you watching our podcast later on in the week, or you listen. So just imagine this tree. It's a pre-lit tree. It's sitting right next to my fireplace, right in front of the barnwood siding, like that's behind it next to my fireplace. And uh, it, it's LED lights. So it goes back and forth between either white lights or the multicolored lights. Now, I love the multicolored lights. Why? Because I don't know about y'all, but how many of you had the big old bulbs, like the multicolored bulbs on your tree as a kid, right? And within each one of those bulbs was a little nuclear reaction because when you touched it, it was so flipping hot, it would burn you, right? Burn your tree down. Like we had melted pieces on our tree because those lights were so hot, but now they have little ones and I love them. And so I turn it on the color setting and it has all the pretty colors. My wife hates it. She always turns it to white. So every morning I turn it to color because I do that because it's a foot thing. And then she turns it um, back to white. So we have this like feud, this dissension, 
kitchen, in our house, um, and I win because I like to push the button more than she does. And so the reason, though, that it's my favorite Christmas tree isn't because it's pre-lit. It's not because it has the colored lights. The reason it's my favorite Christmas tree is because it has all of our homemade ornaments on it. And um, ornaments from my, and I, I, so I'm looking through it, and there's, I don't know, there's probably a hundred on there. I'm looking through it, I'm looking at each and every single one of them, and there's ornaments that go way back to like 2004, I think. Uh, we got married in 2004, so that makes sense. There may be a few ones from when Angelica was a baby, um, but I'm looking at all these ornaments. Now, do y'all do this? Do you look at ornaments on your tree? So if you're watching from home, type in, what is your favorite ornament on your Christmas tree? Uh, there's not a single one of those that is pre-made. It, they're all custom in some way or another, or at least they've been customized with our names on them. And I look at all these ornaments, and I'm especially drawn to the ones that my kids made while they were in school. Oh, remember Christmas parties at school? My kids, I used to be able to go to their Christmas parties and hang out with them, and we had Christmas concerts. Uh, Facebook reminds me every year. Um, we also have Amazon photos that bring us up all these memories. And I'm grieving right now, and I'm mad, and I'm angry, because I look back at those, and I'm like, I just want it to be like that. I want to go to a Christmas party at an elementary school. This is a 40-year-old grown man. That's weird, but, but that's just where I'm at in my life. I want... I want that. I want all the things that in my head at least, right, as I look at the tree and I remember, and those stories come back to life in my mind, I want it to be like that again. Anybody with me? You guys feel the same way? These stories, these ornaments that represent a story, each one has its own story, whether it was a vacation or whether it was a cell phone from 2008. It was a Blackberry. There's a Blackberry on my tree, at least a picture of a Blackberry, on my tree that my daughter made for Christmas one year. It's like, Merry Christmas 2008, right? Back when Blackberries were a thing. And so my kids are like, why are you talking about fruit? It was a cell phone. It's like the first smartphone for all of you that don't know. Uh, They're amazing. I had one for years. And I look at these ornaments and I grieve a little bit and I cry a little bit. But I, I look at it, and, and there's, there's something else going on, and I can't quite figure out what it is. But I experience a small form of hope with that Christmas tree. I love that Christmas tree. It makes me smile. Every morning, I get up, I go down. The first thing I do, like I don't do anything else. There's no coffee, there's no drinks of water, there's no bathroom break. The first thing I do is go over and click that button, turn that tree on makes me smile. It makes my heart light up. It makes me joyful from the inside out. And I think about all the things that we used to do. So what does your family Christmas tree look at? What are the stories in your family? What is it that makes your family what it is? And I hope that your Christmas tree tells that story. If it's not, I'm sure there's Christmas decorations that tell that story. I'm sure there's pictures in your house. I'm sure there's artifacts. There's things in your house that represent something that tell the story of your family, of where you guys come from, of who you are. And this Advent season, this is the first Sunday of Advent, Advent, if I can say that right, um, we're kicking off Advent at church. And so like a lot of you, how many of you, type this in if you do. Actually, I got a, a thing for y'all to do. This, over the next few weeks, every week we're gonna light this Advent candle. So if you have an Advent candle, I wanna invite you to light it with me. And so there's five candles, and one represents hope, one represents joy, one represents peace, and one represents love, and the middle candle is the light of Christ. And so there's a special order to this that you cannot deviate from, and I don't know that order. So I just light a candle every week, because the nature of, and so this week, it's the candle of hope. There's a candle that represents hope in our life. We're going to talk about hope today. But the the premise of an Advent wreath, where it comes from, uh, even the idea of Advent, Advent simply means a time of waiting, a time of anticipation. Now, throughout the history of time, all, um, whether it's religious or pagan, a lot of people say we have pagan roots in our religion. Yes, we do. Uh, pagan just means like rural or from the earth, right? Uh, pagan, um, that, that's what those things mean. And so throughout the history of time, for tens of thousands of years, we have celebrated what is happening going on around us. And so all religious ceremonies and celebrations revolve around feasts, right? So the time of year of harvest, or they revolve around the position of the moon or the position of the sun. And what I mean by that is in spring, when we celebrate Easter, that routine, that ritual had been in place for thousands of years. The Christians just adopted it because it makes sense that in the death of something, something new arises, right? In the springtime. 
We have the spring equinox. In the summer, you have the summer solstice. The summer solstice is the longest day of the year. And by longest day, I don't mean the actual, like the length of the 24-hour day. There's the most sunlight in uh, June, June 20th, 21st, somewhere around there. There's more sunlight that in that day than any other day. And so, uh, and the opposite of that, so then you have fall, and in the fall, there's harvest, right? So October, Halloween-ish, or Thanksgiving, we celebrate the harvest. That goes back tens of thousands of years. And then the winter solstice, so the shortest day of the year, the least amount of sunlight, happens, uh, now it happens on December 21st. It used to happen on December 25th. They've adjusted the calendar. Uh, And so there is this celebration this time of year, and the time between harvest... Uh, which we celebrate, we harvest all the food and we store up and hopefully we've harvested enough food that we have enough to get us through the winter, right? That was the celebration. These themes, we still celebrate all these themes. We just tie them to religious aspects now, right? Christianity comes along and they tie what was already happening in the culture and in the community. They tie them into their faith, uh, much like other religions. Okay, so so you have Christianity that emerges. This, this, like, this is a story of Advent. This is where Advent comes from. And so you have Christianity emerge in the, the, the Middle East, right? It goes into Italy and to Rome. And then it grows, and it grows up north. And it crosses over into the Celtic region. And in the Celtic region, their, their, uh, their mythology, their belief system, uh, they had this idea of a tree. And the tree was like represents all things that are good. And the tree has deep roots, right? That represent the source of all goodness. The tree has a trunk, which is where we reside. And the tree reaches up into the heavens, right? Which is where the unknown is, the mystery, the amazingness. And of course, we merge those two worlds and we live around the trunk and humanity is in the middle part. We bring both essence of who we are and the heavens, the holy, the spiritual, we bring those things together and that's where we reside. And so Christianity goes north and they experience and there's this tree and on December 24th, uh, they take one of these trees that is barren, that is empty and they decorate it. Because that's what trees do, right? They go through and in preparation and fall and winter, they lose their leaves. But before they lose their leaves, they break, turn this beautiful bright colors and they lose their leaves. And because of that, they're celebrating the fact that going forward after the 25th, which is the winter solstice, sunlight is coming. Growth is getting ready to come. The sunlight is coming back. The warmth is coming back. And in our Christian faith, we light candles because the days get shorter and shorter and shorter. So we light more and more candles to represent that we need more and more light. In the Celtic tradition, which is where we get the idea of a Christmas tree, in the Celtic tradition, um, we have this, they have this idea that they embrace the darkness because there's more and more and more darkness. And they say that in the darkness, we can embrace that because it's in darkness that we reset, right? That we renew, that we recreate. I love that word recreate, like recreation, right? To go have fun, like a recreational vehicle comes from the word recreate, that we recreate ourselves during this time. You know, that's how your body works. When it gets dark at night, your body produces this thing called melatonin and it actually works based on the sunlight and then you go to sleep and then you wake back up and everything is renewed. Everything is made fresh. Recreation has happened. You are made new. Your cells literally rebuild themselves at night. And so in the Celtic tradition, they take this time of darkness and they say, you know, this time of darkness this however long it is now we would say it's from um, the weekend after thanksgiving right until christmas and so we celebrate this time and they reflect on the darkness and they say you know what these are the things where we can reset where we can make something space for something new and so what it, right the christians hear that and they say oh yeah that's we do that right we just have this guy named jesus and 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 he's a part he's the light of our life and, and he sheds light on us and this is what we're looking for and so there, there's all this this history of what christmas and and the beauty of christianity the beauty of, of american christmas is that we take all these bits and pieces from all these cultures and we pull them into one thing um, the Nordic tradition was they took big logs during this dark time, right? These massive, massive logs, and they light them on fire, and they burn from one end to the other. And guess how long that took? About 12 days. That's where we get the 12 days of Christmas. That's where we get the idea of a Yule log. All these things come together to make up Advent, to make up Christmas. And they shed light on who we are. This is the heritage of it, and it's a beautiful thing. But it doesn't always look like what we think it should be. Right? Because there's darkness. And it's in that darkness that I believe we, we miss the idea of what Christmas and Advent should be. 
So we, we, we take this time, and we are supposed to be talking about hope. This Advent season is a time of waiting, of anticipation. But what are we waiting and anticipating? Now, I want to go back to one of our earliest stories in the Bible about what our ancestors were anticipating and waiting for. Now, they were waiting for a Savior, right? A Messiah. Messiah just means Savior. And then the, 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 the personification of Messiah is the word Christ, Right, so that's where we get the word Jesus Christ. Christ wasn't his surname or his last name, right? It wasn't, we need a table for two for Mr. Christ. That wasn't like, they didn't even use that name. He was Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. He was Jesus of Nazareth. And Christ or Messiah or Savior was the title they gave him after the fact. And so they were looking for a Savior. Now, how many of us today are still looking for a Savior? I mean, in our cultures, we still look to this. We like the idea of a savior. We like the idea of somebody who's going to come save us and fix our problems. Um, there's a lot of good movies about this. Uh, what is it? Star Wars has a savior in it, right? Depending on which saga you're looking at, it's either Ray or it's Luke or it's uh, Anakin. There's some savior in the story. Um, the Matrix has Neo, right? There's a savior in the story. Superhero movies. Superhero movies are everywhere, and they're huge, and they're massive, and everybody loves them. And I want you to think of your greatest superhero. So if you're a superhero movie fan, or even if you're not, everybody knows about superheroes. right? If you're a DC person, you might say Superman. I'd be like, ah, he's not the greatest superhero. I mean, he's okay, but he has superpowers, right? So, what, you know, and I think you could argue what makes him great isn't his superpowers, but the fact that he's a nice, kind person. Or you might say, uh, the other one might be Batman, right? Now, Batman, I might... I might be on board with because Batman doesn't have superpowers, right? He's just an average guy. Now he has lots of money. He has fancy magic suits and magic cars and magic jets, right? Let's go to the Marvel world. Um, uh, Iron Man, right? Iron Man, maybe the greatest superhero of all time. He didn't have powers, right? He was just, uh, it wasn't an average man. He was a rich man, but he still had a super suit. Now I would challenge the greatest superhero of all time is Black Widow. Now, there's a spoiler alert. I'm just going to warn you right now. Black Widow is the greatest superhero of all time because guess what? She had no superpower. She had no super suit. She wasn't rich. She didn't have a bunch of money. And spoiler alert, she sacrifices herself. She dies for the good of all humanity. Now, that's a superhero that should speak to us. That's a superhero that should tell us volumes about who we are in our humanity. And of course, I'm making all that reference because that's the way Jesus lived his life. Jesus was a superhero. Jesus was Emmanuel, God who was with us, God made flesh. And often, I think we tend to focus on the supernatural parts of Jesus. We, so there's Jesus and there's Christ. Jesus performed miracles. Jesus was the son of God. But that isn't what made Jesus great. I mean, Jesus healed people and did all these things, but that's not what made Jesus great. What made Jesus great were the things that he taught us, right? That there is life, that we have to die to self, that there is life beyond that. That we can make a difference, that life's about sacrifice. That's the Christ part of Jesus. Christ is not the miracles. It's not him rising from the dead. It's not him doing all these crazy things. Those are great. Those are awesome. And those are amazing. That's the Jesus part of him. But the cosmic Christ, these ideals that we can live up to, that are personified in Jesus, are the things that he taught us, the way he lived his life. So I want to go back to our Jewish brothers and sisters, the root to our faith, our Hebrew faith, and I want to talk about the kind of hero, um, the kind of savior that they were looking for. So if you're, if you're reading along with me, go back to Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is in our, what we call the Old Testament. Isaiah was a prophet. And the word prophet simply, it's not that God uh, spoke to Isaiah and dictated to him exactly what he should say and wrote down. A prophet was a person who was knowledgeable, knowledgeable of their faith and of their ancestry, and had the ability to look back at their history and see patterns in that history and then would write down and say, you're doing the same things again and here are warnings, here are ways you can avoid them. And so this was Isaiah. He was one of those people. And so he he writes these things out, warning people, don't do the same things, don't repeat the same patterns. You can break these patterns. There's new things you can do. And then he personifies all these good things and he personifies this and he places it into a person. He says, look, there's going to be a savior. So he predicts Jesus's birth. And I want to read that. So this is what Isaiah thought 
um, the Savior was going to be. This is what the Hebrew people, this is, this is what their superhero, their Savior looked like. It said, the people who had been living in darkness, here's this idea of darkness, have seen a great light. The light of life has shined on those who dwelt in the shadowy darkness of death. And you, God, will make it happen. You bolster the nation, making it great again. You have saturated it with joy. Everyone in it is full of delight in your presence, like the joy they experience at the harvest. Right, so we're going back to harvest is one of the things they celebrated thousands of years ago. We still celebrate it today. So after the harvest, there's going to be great joy. It's going to be like that. Like the thrill of dividing up the spoils of war. Of course, we wouldn't embrace that. For as you did back in the day when Midian oppressed us, you will shatter the yoke that burdens them. You will lift the load that weighs them down. You will break the rod of their oppressors. Okay, so the Hebrew people, are, are, they're being oppressed uh, by other people. They were slaves. And this Savior is going to come break that pattern. The Savior is going to save them from the rod. The rod, they literally used to beat them with it, okay? He says, it's true. All the, fa- all the fabric of war will go up in flames. Now, I like that. So the idea of war, well, we won't even need it anymore. The troops' heavy boots that stamped us down and their blood-soaked garb will all be burned beyond recognition or use. There will be a new time, a fresh start, hope of all hopes, dream of our dreams. A child is born sweet-breathed. A son is given to us a living gift. And even now, with tiny features and dewy hair, he is great. The power of leadership and the weight of authority will rest on his shoulders. His name, his name will be known in many ways. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Dear Father Everlasting, Ever Present, Never Failing, Master of Wholeness, and the Prince of Peace. Isaiah is describing what this Savior, what this Emmanuel, the God who is going to be with us, what he's going to look like, and how we're going to recognize him. He'll be a Prince of Peace. He'll be a master of wholeness. We will call him God. We'll call him a counselor. His leadership will bring such prosperity as you've never seen before. Sustainable peace for all time. So all this is saying that God is going to give something to us, a new way. And this new thing should bring us prosperity and peace. This child, God's promise to David, a throne forever among us, to restore restore sound leadership that cannot be perverted or shaken. He will ensure justice without fail and absolute equity, always. The intense passion of the eternal, commander of the heavenly armies, will carry this to completion. So you read all of that of what the Savior is supposed to look like. All these descriptions, all these words, all these attributes to what a Savior should be. And what do the Hebrew, our ancestors, what what do we do actually to this day? There's one line at the end that says, Master and Commander of the Heavenly Armies. And we take that, and we take the part about the rod, the rod will be spared from us, the rod will be taken away, taken away, and and we, we fixate on that. And so they were looking for a God and a Savior that was going to come and protect them from whatever oppressors that they had to overthrow. Usually they thought that this person, this Savior, was going to go to war. And of course, we know that war only begats more war. War actually never begats peace. Peace doesn't come from war. Peace comes from talking and learning and new ways of thinking. And so um, they take all this, all these words, all these things, and, and they're looking for a war hero. Somehow, out of all those descriptions, they end up looking for a war hero. So when Jesus shows up on the scene, when Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is born, they don't necessarily accept him as their savior. They want a person who's going to go to Pontius Pilate, and when Pontius Pilate says, who are you? Are you the son of the living God? And you say, well, that's what you say, so be it. They want that person to say, I am the son of God, and to swing his arm, and a bunch of angels come down with swords and arrows and destroy and kill everybody. That's not the savior they needed, though. Their problems weren't that they were oppressed. That was one of their problems, but that wasn't their only problem. Their idea, the story they were telling themselves, was that God looked like a war hero. And never did they think to look inside of themselves or look at something else. That maybe God shows up in different ways. 
That God shows up in other stories. That God shows up in different ways in our life and our community. And of course, he shows up in Jesus. And Jesus teaches us to think a new way. Jesus invites us into a new space. Jesus invites us to a new way of thinking. And so who is your savior? Who are you looking for? Are we looking for the superheroes of the world that are magic? They're going to come down and fix our problems? Are we looking for the perfect Christmas with the perfect ornament with the perfect tree? You know, last night I was watching a movie. A friend of mine texted me, and there's this new Christmas movie on Hulu. And she's like, you got to watch this. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll watch it. And so I watched this movie. And at the end of it, I'm bawling, I'm crying. And the premise of the movie was uh, there was this, this family, and he had three daughters. And I don't know why I related to it, but he had three daughters. And they were grown and, and out of the house. And they're all getting back together for Christmas, like Christmas movies do. And as they uh, get back together for Christmas, uh, the, the dad is the city councilman and he's running for mayor and uh the mom has all these parties and she wants to have the perfect christmas right we want the perfect christmas tree with the perfect ornaments with all the perfect things we want our perfect christmas concerts we want our perfect christmas party we want all these things to be perfect and of course guess what happens like all christmas movies it all goes to hell right it all just goes to i mean one daughter's on the verge of divorce another one's gay and she comes out of the closet the third one doesn't feel accepted and it just blows up in the middle of this party And I'm sitting there um, weeping because we've all been in that place where we feel like our world is falling apart. And right now, we're probably not even going to have Christmas Eve services. Do you know how much that breaks my heart? That terrifies me. I can't go to Christmas plays with my kids. I can't see them sing in concerts. I can't be here and light candles with all of you this Christmas Eve. That breaks my heart. I don't even remember Easter this year because we were shut down and I don't remember any of it. And now we're probably not going to have Christmas Eve. Are you kidding me? That is chaotic. That makes me upset. That, that disturbs me to my core. But I have to remember. You see, that family in that movie found that despite all those things that they thought were going to be horrible, there's, there's a beauty in Christmas. There is a hope in Christmas, and the hope in Christmas isn't in the perfect tree. The hope in Christmas isn't in the Christmas parties. It's not in the concerts. It's not sitting in a service and lighting a candle. Those things are amazing, and they're great. But you take them all away, and what do we have? We still have each other. The hope of Christmas is that we can live it right here, right now. The things that Jesus brought us and the things that he taught us, he didn't teach us to wait on a Savior that's going to take care of our problems. Jesus invites us into a new way of life and that we can make a difference right now, whether we're in person and together or whether we're at our home. Some of you who are watching this right now found a gift on your porch. Somebody from the church delivered something for your children this morning. We can make a difference right now. We can live in this moment. And it's not going to look picture perfect. It's not going to look amazing. It's going to look chaotic. It's going to look ugly. It's going to be a mess. But it doesn't matter. The hope of Christmas is that we can live right here, right now. The message of Jesus, the ideals of Christ and who and what that is means that we can make a difference today. We can choose happiness and joy and love and hope we're actually not waiting i know advent means to wait but we're like the celts right we realize that in this dark time that we find ourselves in that we can reflect that we can renew that we can recreate who we are and who we are as people of love and joy and peace and that when we live those things out in our life That is what brings us hope. And I believe it is our job, it is my job to give you that message every week. And it is our job as a community to give you the tools to do that. So all of you that are watching right now, if you're watching on your phone, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. But I'm going to ask you to get your phones out. And you're going to text this number behind me. You're going to text ADVENT, A-D-V-E-N-T, to the number 816 608 Six zero eight six two seven zero, and you're going to text that number. What that's going to do is that is going to give you this. This is called an advent calendar, and on this advent calendar, we're not looking to the future for some 
um, utopian hope of going back to the things, we, things the way they were. We're saying today, this month, and the next 25 days, you have an opportunity to impact those around you. It's in impacting those around you that you can live in the moment, that you can provide hope, that you can be the light while we still experience the renewal of darkness. And so text that number. Um, you're gonna, this will come to your phone, and every day it's going to invite you to do stuff, okay? And I want to hear your stories. I want you to email me. I want you to write your stories. Stuff like purchase gift for children in foster care, donate a winter coat, make a toiletry kit to donate. There are 25 things on this list of how we can provide hope to our communities right now, today, and the next 25 days through Advent, through this Christmas season. As you text that, as you do this, as you like and share this post, uh, this feed, let's go to God and in prayer. God, we thank you uh, for Advent. And, and God, even though we use this term Advent, that we are waiting for something, God, help us to remember that the way of life that you came and showed us, the commandment that you gave to us uh, to go out, to love all those God, to lay our life down for our friends, that is the greatest calling that we can have, that we can do that whether we are together in person or whether we are separate in our own worlds. God, we can be present in this moment. God, we don't have to look back and hope that things will return to the way they were. We can experience your hope, your love, your joy, and your peace right now. And God, that is the hope that you bring us. That during these next 25 days, that as our days become shorter, as darkness grows, God, help us to embrace that darkness. Help us to embrace, to renew, to recreate who we are, who our communities are, and what a real Christmas means. And God, we know that means that it's broken. And it might be ugly. God, it might be a mess. And it's not going to look the way it used to. God, help us to grieve through those things. But help us to embrace the new. Help us to embrace the now. And help us to have that hope. God, we love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen.
I want you to share on social media those Advent calendars. And I hope, my hope for you, for your families, is that your trees are ugly, your dinners are messy, your presents are awful, but that you remember there is hope in being present and loving those around us. Go be Christmas this Advent season. Go in peace.